Welcome to Brandon Avant. Uh, today we are joined by Amanda Ballin, who is a multi-talented uh, friend of Jason and ours. Um, she um, was one of Jason's favorite students at the University of the Um and she is a poetess and uh, has uh, written her master's thesis on uh, Joel Peter Whitkin, who happens to be one of my favorite uh, uh, photographers. And we're going to be talking about uh, the grotesque. Um, Mandy, would you like to start with the thought experiment? Right, I'm going to start with a vivid thought experiment. So I'd like you to imagine that you're standing in front of Goya's Saturn Devouring His Son, which is an incredibly famous painting. And um, let me um, help you to imagine the painting. The painting is of a kind of undulating man who looks semi-human and semi-lion, almost furry, um, with his quite sort of amorphous uh, son in his hand, beheaded, having sort of chewed his head off and the blood is lifting out like strawberry jam in this cannibalistic act. And in the background, we have what Italian, in the Italian word, we have chiaroscura, we have a smoky, um, dark, shadowy chamber. Um, and you look at this painting and on your first gut sense, had this happened in real life, you would have frozen and fled and you would have been utterly horrified. Potentially, you would have vomited. And that would be your intuitive response. And for some reason, you can't stop looking. You are intrigued. You are pulled to it. Um, your eyes skirt and dance around the painting. It's, and even when you go home, you might think about it, be curious about it. And forever, that image is unforgettable. It has sunken into your psyche. You may even have nightmares about it at night or even daydreams. <laughs> and this is a, the, the fact that it's intriguing is a puzzle for philosophers. In fact, um, Early on, Hume, the great philosopher Hume, thought that it was quite mysterious as to why in Greek tragedy people were absolutely fascinated and, and um, absorbed by tragedy. Later on, we have this contem the contemporary philosopher Noel Carroll with, uh, postulating the same inquiry. Why is it that horror movies do brilliantly, that people are captivated and in awe of horror, and that although intuition tells us that we would turn away and skirt and hurry away, we somehow can't stop looking. And this is the same predicament that we face with ugliness. Ugliness by definition, has, uh, by definition is that aesthetic experience which should cause pain. And pain by definition is that which causes us to turn away, to shriek, to abscond. And yet for some reason, ugly, ugliness and ugly art is that which pulls us deep into it through fascination and intrigue. And this is the puzzle that we are going to be solving today. If ugliness is not that which is painful, then what is it? And how could it possibly be defined as the opposite of beauty? Beauty as that which is ultimately the utmost pleasurable sensation. So what's interesting to my mind, as you say, is you've got this paradox. So there's certain work that intrigues us, that pulls us in, partly because it deals with things that are macabre. Um, I wonder when we think about ugliness, it feels like there's a big ambiguity. There's a whole bunch of things that we might think of as ugly. So Roger Scruton talks about um, 60s brutalist architecture, those sort of you know, very square looking um, blocks of flats. Uh, and he says, you know, these are, are ugly. No one wants to live here because they are so functional that they cease to actually have a function. Um, but for him, in other words, ugly is the absence of beauty. Whereas if we think about um, this piece by Goya, it's horrific, um, but it's visceral, and we think of it as somehow majestic. Um, so are there these different ways in which a thing could be ugly, and are some of those ugly traits actually um, good traits? Okay, so in my own work, I've, I have had to come head to head, in fact, had a head on collision with semantics when it comes to aesthetic terms. And there's been very little work done on, on or definitional work done on really refining the meaning of aesthetic terms. And in fact, there's some sort of aesthetic experience that have been unnamed, they are ineffable. Um, and the, sort of the main debate that I think arises in the contemporary um, literature is this, this debate between what constitutes what's called an evaluative aesthetic experience or evaluative aesthetic term and what constitutes what we call the substantive. So there are two evaluative or verdictive terms. This, this definition arises in the work of 
Zangwill and Levinson. These two terms are what we call thin terms, and all they do is prescribe a certain good or bad value onto the object. Um, and those two terms are the pinnacle terms, beauty and ugliness. And in this sense, if beauty is merely sort of defined or entrenched or reduced to the good, then we can just say that ugliness, if ugliness is the bad, then ugliness is, we can just by definition reason that ugliness must simply be the non-beautiful. And there are all kinds of problems that are logical problems that arise there. Um, and then we have, on the, other, on the other hand, we have what are called substantive aesthetic um, qualities or terms that sort of represent or um, denote the sort of a textual experience. They, they are thick descriptive terms that describe some sort of aesthetic experience occurring in the object, which is a what I would call perceptive felt experience. And those can range from the surreal, the macabre, the grotesque, the delicate, the dreary, the dumpy. Philosophers have sort of looked at the sort of cornucopia and panoply of these terms because they, they are fascinating. Um, and those do more than simply announce goodness or badness. But what's fascinating about the realm of the grotesque, uh, of, of, of aesthetics, is that we can easily marshal these as species of either the good or the bad. And the question arises as to why we can do that. So, Mandy, I, I'm very glad that you're on the show. Firstly, because I haven't seen you in ages. Um, but secondly, because I am aesthetically blind in a lot of ways. Um, I struggle to pick out what a lot of other people will call beautiful things or beautiful paintings. And maybe I'm also kind of like ugliness blind. Uh, I won't quite pick out what the same things as other people pick out as ugly. Um, and so for someone like me, what I'd be curious in, in understanding is just very simply, what is ugliness? Um, earlier you said um, you gave kind of a working definition of ugliness as that which causes pain and that which you would feel aversion towards. Is that the only definition or, or does it get more complicated than that? So I think that's a problematic definition and that's a definition of emotivist theorists who claim that by announcing something is beautiful, all you are saying is, Gully, or it's, it's synonymous with saying something is gorgeous or lovely or just saying G words um, or gasping. So um, those it's, in it's, those it's like saying it's it's like saying I like that or I don't like that. That's puffy or that's nice, right? That's ugly or beautiful. Absolutely. Not only that, it's a, a much more snooty judgment. And um, one is asserting that something is good or bad with a kind of um, arrogance. Um, and so for me, that's problematic for several reasons. Firstly, that account um, suggests that the very realm of the aesthetic is problematically hedonic. Um, that what is good and bad, if we assume that beauty is good and that judgment that, is, that claim that it is good is based on the other idea that it's good because it is pleasurable, then the realm of the aesthetic becomes hedonic. And um, there are all kinds of other consequences, like, for example, what we call the aesthetic pluralism argument, that if, if, if um, something isn't, if that which isn't sort of good or pleasurable is not beauty, then every single aesthetic quality is just the non-beautiful or just a form of ugliness. So there are all kinds of strange consequences that arise from that. And so what I strive to do in my work was to promote or construct what I call an aesthetic egalitarianism where I generated um, a kind of archive or Bible or project of sort of various, the multitude of aesthetic properties. And then I looked at sort of how they worked in the taxonomy and categorizing them. And once I looked at what intuitively were the species of ugliness I, and looked at sort of reports on, on what, how people had described the experience of ugliness, I came up with my own definition. And my own definition was based on a difference between this, what we call the aesthetically ugly, ugliness is merely a verdict of badness, and a sort of certain substantive phenomenological qualitative sensation that needs psychological excavation. It needs excavation of, of psychological literature in order to flesh out. So my own definition was that ugliness, the experience of ugliness is less of a, as an experience of an object, is less of a kind of thing it needs to be in order to be a type of thing or a thing at all. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. You'll have, you'll have to tell me more. All right, so, okay, just repeat that. Ugliness, ugliness is less, just, just repeat your definition. Object is less of the thing it needs to be in order to be a type of thing or a thing at all. All right, all right, all right, all right. Take me through that <laughs> because my small philosophical brain is struggling to make sense of it. Grappling with um, 
uh, begins. Um, the work, I guess the foundation for this is understanding what an aesthetic experience is. And that took me sort of multiple months to try and define that. It's very poorly defined in the literature. Um, when we look at the origin of the word um, in Greek, it's obviously it arises from the Greek word to perceive. And if we think about Plato's work, a perceptual experience is an illusionary semblance. So Plato thinks that it's sort of removed from truth. Um, there, is, there are two definitions of the word aesthetic. The one is simply that something is beautiful. So people say this is aesthetic. That's often sort of conflated with just saying something is done in good taste or that it is beautiful. The other thing is that it's a way of, it's a way, it's aesthetic. It has a certain, it, it has an aesthetic quality and we can, we can have to define that aesthetic, quite a specific type of aesthetic quality with an adjective. So it has a specific aesthetic. Um, we ha it has an ugly aesthetic, it has a kitsch aesthetic, it has a glamorous aesthetic, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, so on that definition, the realm of the aesthetic is what I call the perceptive belt. Um, it is, if we look at, think about Locke's primary and secondary quality, it's a quality that human beings perceive in and amongst an interaction of physical properties in the object or perception of his physical properties in the object and sensory properties. So those that have to do with sight, the olfactory, all of those properties. And for, in some way, human, as those, those, um, inter, those properties interact, we kind of, we have what is called a sense organ that can detect in and amongst all of those things, some, like a barcode, some sort of aesthetic property that we are able to name. So from what I understand, the aesthetic is experiential. So, and, you know, obviously we can experience art in lots of different ways. So if we think about that experience of being in front of a painting, there's a visual experience, which might bring about certain internal states, um, certain emotional qualities. Um, we can imagine having an aesthetic experience um, while dancing, which might be very physical and, um, you know, sort of also in, internal, but with others. Um, you could have it with food, I assume, that you could taste a beautiful meal uh, or drink, uh, you know, a glass of wine that has certain aesthetic qualities. I mean, this is the interesting thing about art is that we're dealing with this cluster of things um, that are quite different from each other. Um, you know, if you think about the experience of, of reading a novel, it's going to be very different from, you know, watching a, a live classical music performance. But somehow there is this term of the aesthetic experience. So how do we use this term to sort of better understand all these disparate works of art and disparate experiences? Um, okay, so first we have to, it's really important that we acknowledge that a work of art, well, I think all objects, you know, Dante makes this point that almost all objects in the world are aesthetic in some way or have some kind of aesthetic, has some sort of aesthetic quality, um, although we have yet to define or, or put into words some of those aesthetic qualities, some of them are ineffable to us. Um, and so therefore, work of art, all works of art, if all objects are, then it's likely that all works of art are. Um, there is one exception to this, which the philosophers are still trying to work on, is this notion of, or this question about whether ideas are aesthetic, because they are non-sensory. And the very super, one of the supervenian sort of bases of aesthetic is that it is sensory. So it has a perceptual element of, of you know, it requires a sort of sensory experience, a conceptual experience, and then what I call the felt, which we will go into later. But one of the important um, ideas around in, in art, um, particularly in, in contemporary literature, in fact, I've sort of stu studied through Sotheby's this year, um, who have worked intensely at actually developing courses just on this question, is that artworks don't have to be aesthetic in order, to, the, the aesthetic quality isn't the determining feature of the artwork. Um, potentially in antiquity, um, an artwork, one of the key characteristics that, that made something an artwork was that it was beautiful. But now all kinds of other features of the artwork designated as such. So that's, it's very curious to me that uh, aesthetics require um, sensory input. Um, so I'll tell you why is because, well, I, you, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm an artist because I'm a writer. So I write fiction. And what's interesting is that sometimes people call fiction writers artists and sometimes they don't. Um, and it seems to me like writing could be beautiful, even though it only happens within our minds. I mean, you, when you say that the writing is beautiful, you're not saying that the 
the experience of looking at the lettering on the page is beautiful, although you could have beautifully typeset books. I mean, I can imagine that. But really, the kind of experience I'm referring to is the experience of reading the writing, um, even listening to it. Um, but it's not the, the voice of the narrator or, the, or the, the, the font on the page that I'm really talking about. It's the ideas that they refer to, that those ideas are very beautiful. Um, you can imagine beautiful writing or ugly writing, right? Are those aesthetic experiences? Um, they're not sensory? So as a poet, I disagree with you. I think that poetry is, well, all writing, good writing is poetic. And that, um, unless it isn't, I guess they've never deemed art. Um, journalistic writing, I mean, I think some journalistic writing is also beautiful, or not even beautiful, aesthetic. Um, and there are people who have worked on this problem. Um, I think that um, all writing is, in, in, is deeply auditory and that although we don't hear it out aloud, there's a part of us that whispers it to ourselves. There's also an aesthetic experience that we, of a kind of aesthetic experience we get from reading in the sense that the eye moves along, the pe uh, along words in a pleasurable way. And that a lot of people have described, or even great writers have described the fact that that's that kind of synchronicity, that kind of, um, you know, in ballet we call it adagio or, 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 or bellan, ballet, bellan. it's almost a quality of the dancer is embodied in the very experience of reading. So, um, and then also there's a sort of imaginative generation. I guess we could think about um, like the homunculus. So if you think about looking at our mind's eye, that people do argue that it's not, that actually we do, are generating montage-like paintings as we read. So those are some of the answers that people give when thinking about the aesthetic qualities of a piece of writing. Okay, well then, then I've got an interesting objection to that view. Um, so the objection is this, is that there are certain people um, who cannot imagine anything in their minds visually. They cannot imagine um, a visual landscape in their minds. Now, it's called aphantasia. Um, I have this problem, but not as severely as some people. So I can imagine very, very basic things, maybe like shadows and, and like just, just like basic shapes. Um, where some people, I understand most people can, can visualize things in a lot of detail. Um, I can't do that. But there are people who can't do it at all, right? Now, is the contention there that someone with aphantasia, when they read, they experience no imaginary beauty. There's no beauty there in their imagination. So when I imagine things, the visual, the visual aspect of it, you know, imagining something visual is a very, very small component and sometimes absent completely. For me, what is beautiful about the thing imagined is a conceptual beauty. It's the way the ideas interrelate in a way that's almost like a dance, but it's not visual. And it doesn't feel sensory in any way. It feels entirely conceptual, but I can distinguish between when those concepts are related in a beautiful way and when they're related in an ugly way or just not related in any kind of aesthetic way. But that would be a problem for the account, right? Because the account says that you, it's relying on, on those sensory properties. Um, so there are also philosophers who've looked at that. Um, there's also criticism in aesthetics that there's a preoccupation with the visual. In fact, there's almost, there's a dearth of work. There's almost a lacuna on the olfactory, for example, and there's some philosophers and neuroscientists now who are actually working on the aesthetics of smell because it is a very important domain. Um, but in terms of, I mean, you could look to Plato because Plato is the, this idea of the, the form, the sort of an idea as being, you know, the perfect exemplar of beauty. I guess it's entrenched and has its early beginnings and roots in Plato's work. And um, I think one of the sort of ideas I came up with in doing my work is this idea of metaphor, that mathematics can be beautiful, or because mathematics obviously is a sort of an abstract idea, or ideas themselves can be beautiful because they feel in some way in, in their perfect rationality and sort of befittingness and sort of puzzle piece coherence, they sort of embody a certain elegance that one would see in a great painting. So there is That's a kind of metaphorical sort of exemplification so I have a question of Mark then, um, because I don't usually do this in the podcast, but I think Mark would have something very interesting to say about this because Mark really loves studying the Myers-Briggs scale. Um, and what, 
one of the one of the the questions in the Myers Briggs scale is whether um, you are um, an S um, or what is it, Mark? An S or an N, right? A sensor or an intuitor. Um, and I imagine that that um, Mandy's claim that that when we say that math is beautiful, that that's really just a metaphor for some sort of sensory experience. I imagine someone who's a heavy N, an intuitive person, wouldn't think that. They live in the realm of ideas rather than experience things through their senses. And so they wouldn't see that as like the primary thing that's being referred to when you say that math is beautiful. It's beautiful in and of itself within the conceptual realm without having to kind of make this metaphor over to a sensory realm? I don't think one clearly makes the extension um, or extrapolation. I think that one has to work backwards and work very, very hard to decode what is going on there when we gasp or we feel a certain type of flow in sort of mathematical coherence. Um, and I think that people think that and feel a kind of affinity to maths without knowing that. Um, but I do think that is kind of what is going on in the psyche. So Jason, I think you raised something quite interesting, um, which is that different people are different from each other and have different ways of relating to work. And I imagine that the intuitive person is more likely to say something like, maths is beautiful because they can hold the concept of that. Whereas someone who is sensory likes physicality, um, you know, so sensory types are kind of known for enjoying good food, good wine, good drugs. Um, you know, intuitive types are, are more uh, internal. They kind of, you know, uh, have fantastical thoughts. And you might find that the kinds of works of art that they relate to are going to be quite different. So, Mandy, one of the things you alluded to earlier was, you know, these kind of conceptual works of art where the, the joy of the work is in the idea of it, um, that it's trying to create a kind of internal experience. And maybe there's some bits of it that are external, um, but it's, it's very much about uh, how we think about it. Um, are there any particular works of conceptual art that you think would be uh, good to reflect on? Well, there's the whole minimalist movement of art, um, and we can show some as, as I can show a series of them. Um, there's Sol Luet, for example, um, and there is Amish Kapoor, you know, in contemporary culture, there's his work. Um, and um, the idea, so the whole movement of conceptual art um, is revolves around this emphasis on the, the artwork as a launch pad um, or as an artifact of some kind of thought. A launch pad is that obviously it provokes some sort of um, reasoning or thought process within the viewer and, and the original object doesn't have to have what we call kind of concrete, like artistic concrete exemplification. Um, and or it could hold an idea, be an artifact of some thought process for the for the artist himself. The problem with that is that for me as a formalist, and a formalist is someone who believes that, um, that the intrinsic properties of an artwork are what matter most, the artwork should have to stand for itself and not have an explanation on the side. I think you spoke in one of your earlier episodes about titles. And for me, it's problematic. A work is visual, and then we face this problem of translation about the extent to which a work of art can be translated into some sort of explanation. For me, it shouldn't have to. For me, it speaks a, a sort of visual language of its own and so it should be sort of received like that and um and that for me is the problem with conceptual art unless there is a kind of laissez-faire lackadaisical attitude on the part of the artist in which he doesn't mind sort of injecting any kind of stream of thought into the viewer but often these ideas are quite philosophical and sort of um cerebral and there's a sense in which he is sort of cornering the 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 um, spectator and wanting to get a certain kind of idea and then the work becomes quite problematic. <clears throat> the definition of art is incredibly porous. Um, if we think about Hume's seminal text um, on the standard of taste, um, he obviously he inaugurates this concept of the critic or the idea of critic. He sort of posits the existence of this anointed figure in society, this perfect judge who's able to discern beauty in a work of art and acts as the ultimate standard or the you know the penultimate standard for good taste. Um, although he does agree that there has to be some sort of um, agreement between many judges. It's just um, you, kind of a unanimous decision in order to equalize the playing field. Um, and so that's the origins of that idea, although it's problematic because he only focuses on the, on the, the, the ability to perceive beauty in a work. Um, and so that person has almost an anointed power to 
or consecratory power to designate what constitutes art or what constitutes beauty or not. So that idea sort of extends or um, you know, weaves its way into or tentacles its way through I think, art, the art worlds today. I mean, many of us go to art fairs and are inund inundated with what, you know, incredibly poor standard, what I feel is like a kind of junk fair. Um, and also we are perplexed at the kinds of prices that people would pay for seeming what I call works of emperor's new clothes. Um, and I think, you know, the, the sort of colloquial response or, you know, layperson response to certain artworks as being as good as a child is very telling. So um, there are, there's obviously this idea of the critic, and then later on we get to um, the Brillo box experiment by Danto, um, where we look at how aesthetic properties are not really important in determining works of art. We then get to Dickey um, and his idea of knowledge communities. You know, Danto uh, looks at um, a soap box, which was obviously an, a, a work of art done by Andy Warhol, and he puts it in a, he puts it in a, you know, in his, it's a normal context, and in that context, we don't consider it to be a work of art. When it's placed in a white box cube, um, with the art context, then as a sort of, then we do consider it to be a work of art. And he says that these are uh, invisible to the eye; they are perceptually indistinguishable. And yet, when placed in different contexts, we consider them to be works of art. So that's a so seminal. Is that an objection to your type of formalism? Because you said you're a formalist, which means you think that the aesthetic properties of the art are purely determined by intrinsically to the art rather than in people's experiences. I don't think the aesthetic properties are determined in that way. Um, aesthetic properties always arise in the interaction. Remember, we, I think you were focusing quite a lot on the difference between a sensory and intuitive person. In fact, an aesthetic person has to be both because they're not focused merely on the sensory. People who are sort of hedonists and debaucherous are often not aesthetic. They focus too much on the sort of materiality of the thing and enjoying it instead of standing back and sort of, one does, it requires a certain distancing and objective kind of mulling in order to kind of get at what arises in and within from and amongst that sort of, sort of sensory sort of stuffing on your face. Um, so it's very different. An aesthetic person is not someone necessarily who's incredibly sensual. Um, it's a, quite a balance between both. It does require cerebral capacity too, um, especially if one is going to put that into words. Um, and your question about the, so the, that's not, a formalism has much more to do with the fact that a work of art, and this has nothing to do with aesthetics, has a visual language of its own. And the form of the work of art, the language of the visuality, and not what it represents is far more important than anything else. And it should speak for itself and it cannot be translated. So I'd like to think about a kind of classic work of beautiful art. So if we think about Botticelli's, uh, Venus emerging from the waves. It's this iconic Renaissance work. Um, and one of the things that you write about in your thesis is Joel Peter Whitkin's um, take on that with a, with a photograph where he's used kind of unusual bodies, as you say, this uh, move towards the uh, egalitarian in the aesthetic. So we don't think about um, only skinny blondes as being beautiful. You know, he has... Um, pre-op transsexuals being the term used at the time, uh, the subject of the work, and he recreates um, Botticelli's Venus in this way. And I think for some people, upon first sight of the image, it's an alarming image. It's something that they would describe as grotesque. But at the same time, it is incredibly alluring. Um, you know, you can't help but be absorbed by it. Okay, so if we look first at Botticelli's birth of Venus, um, there are, I just want to just highlight that there are people we call incorporative theorists of the ugly who believe that sort of ugliness makes its way to beauty, that ultimately when we look at ugliness, sort of it's actually just a form of beauty. Sort of, I, I really do, um, I, that idea antagonizes me once again because it re throws beauty as the sort of penultimate, all encapsulative experience in the aesthetic. So I wouldn't like, my aim is not to call Wittgen's work beautiful and to, sort of use the, be the, the fact that it is beautiful as an explanation for our intrigue. My sort of tactic would rather be to name it as ugly, to uncover, to excavate, to indulge, to get in the thick of, into the thick of, of what ugliness is and then to make sense of why it intrigues us. Um, but if we look at Botticelli's Birth of Venus, um, what's really, really important about it is that in its act of representation, of, of certain figures and of certain environments, 
it's embarked on what is called, or to utilize what is called a representational philosophy of idealism. Um, and I think what, you know, in order to explain that, I have to kind of sort of go into the idea of representation in art. Representation in art um, is founded on this idea that what art does is it represents an object. So when you look at a painting, um, of, it's a famous painting, obviously, by Magritte, we can sort of locate it in this example. Magritte paints the path and underneath he writes, Magritte is this famous surrealist painting, and he, had, he painted this painting called The Treachery of the Images, and he painted a beautiful path, um, and underneath he said, this is not a path, in French. And his point was that painting, uh, when we look at a painting, it is not the thing itself, it is a representation of that thing. It is often two-dimensional, and it does what is called trompe le oeil. It tricks the eye into, it tricks us into feeling like we are actually observing that thing, but actually it's just mimesis. And often we think of work of art as good, um, based on the virtuosity of the painter to be able to mimic what we, what we would experience in ordinary waking perceptual life. So it's almost veridicality. Um, and so in, in Renaissance painting, we think that there is what we call realism, but in fact, there's what we call idealism. When you look at these paintings of these bodies, they very much don't mimic an ordinary body at all. In fact, what, they do what, what I call, they de uglify the body. They renovate the body through certain very um, a, a widely acknowledged stylistic devices that were very specific to the Renaissance. Um, and there are many of these devices, and um, we can look at the painting. Um, one important device is what we call um, the sort of outline and the contouring of form, or what we call the element of the sculptural. So when, when in the Renaissance, when bodies are painted, there are, there's the exclusion of anything that would make the, the, the object ugly, and we can get later on into the discussion, and into, I can sort of describe the three heuristics. That make that uh, sort of help help us to identify the ugly object in painting, but there's this sculptural quality that's created by what we egg tempura or gloss varnish, and often you know the painter will outline and then shadow it in and model it in a sculptural kind of way. And also there's what we call geometricization of form, so that when you have sort of a buttocks or a breast, um, there is that's based on ellipses or ellipsoids. Um, it's based on actual geometrical volume. Um, and so that's really important. And then we have the idealization of expression. We often have a serene kind of expression. Um, and we have um, very important spatial devices. For example, the use of the plane. We have the use of a closed form. So you know, appendages aren't sticking out everywhere like they do in the Barak. People are beautifully placed in what we call contrapposto. Um, and often, when you look at these paintings and the scenes, the scenes define natural laws. We don't have a sense of time or place, or gravity, and we have sfumata, which is this dissipating, glowing light, and so we almost feel like we are in heaven, so we don't have the conditions that could manifest ugliness or cause ugliness, and the figures themselves, whether they be objects or people, don't have, are not scathed by time or mortality or anything of the real world. So if we, if we compare then the original Botticelli, as you say, which has these unreal qualities, um, where you kind of have a super beautiful, um, how would you compare that to Joel Peter Witkin's um, look at the sort of same imagery, but through a different lens? Okay, so it's important that my own definition of ugliness, when I defined it earlier, I said it's a thing that's it's less of a thing it needs to be in order to be a kind of thing or a thing at all. So when we look at sort of, when we, when, the way that we organize, this is sort of ont an ontological theory, but the way that we perceive our sort of world around us and the objects in our world are based on concepts, and those concepts are ideal ex ex um, sort of abstractions or extractions or essentialized representations of a certain category, whether that be a peach or whether that be a woman. And we all kind of walk around and we, um, we sort of attach and perceive and outline and, and identify objects based on these categories or these schema or schemata. Um, what happens in an ugly object is it doesn't fit those schema well, and so it's less of a woman or it's less of a peach. Um, and in that instance, these objects become overly unique or out of place. We don't know what to do with them. They almost feel like they, what we call this sort of a representation of the unknown in general. They are uncategorizable, unlocatable. Um, and so we feel incredibly shaky and put off guard, um, which is part of the reason we want to turn away and part of the reason that we are interested. And there are three major features um, or, or heuristics that we can use um, in order to know whether that sort of incites this experience within us. 
One is what I call conceptual, conceptual hybridization. So when we look at something and we can see that it's kind of the marrying or blurring of two conceptual prototypes. So that's why many people find the, the idea of transgenderism offensive or repulsive. Um, or any kind of hybrid being that we find in the grotesque, we often find, or the gothic, we find sort of um, chimerical forms or hybridized beings sort of that, that surge here and there. And we, we think that sort of that is sort of the locus of our horrified response. The other one is what I call sort of physical formlessness, um, which we find when, when the actual physical um, object that sort of exceeds its physical, what we think should be its physical boundaries or doesn't fit within the ideal configuration. And that can be in the form of what I call excessive fleshiness, like fat. That's why people find fat very offensive <laughs> or disturbing. Um, it's any abortive form um, and like amputation um, or nebulous undulate, undulating um, de deliquescent forms, things that feel like they're drooping, which is why many people feel find sort of Klimt's early work ugly. And then the last one is when something is touched by something, a force other than itself. So, so it becomes less of itself. And some of these forces might be death, decay, or disease. And so when we look at the actual subject matter of Witkin's work, and there's a lot more I have to say on why it's ugly, because it also represents what I call an ugly face, which is other than heaven. Um, and I can go into that more, into more detail with maybe another work. But um, the actual subject matter, when you see a transgender person, um, and you know, any, any, many other figures in his works that are deformed, um, of deformed people, uh, of people with sort of multiple genitalia, of people that are sort of anthropomorphic, half human, half horse, and they all kind of fit into, they all display symptoms of, of one or more of these kinds of um, ugly heuristics or signs. So, um, uh, Mandy, I've got two, I've got two thoughts. Um, so the one is coming from a different field, um, and I'm sure you've heard this term before, uh, the uncanny valley. Um, so it's a term used in AI. So you've got these, um, these robots um, who are meant to approximate humans. So they look like people and they've even been designed so that their faces move um, in, in kind of approximate emotional, in, in ways that our faces would move when we experience certain emotions. And what's very interesting is that when they get people to interact with these very new androids, um, the androids that do a very bad job of approximating humans, people quite like them. They feel quite close to them. They, they, they develop a fondness for them, an affinity for them. They even feel attached to them. Um, but once it becomes too close to appearing like a human, they, people feel revulsion at looking at those forms. Um, and they call that the uncanny valley because um, the, the way it works is that as you become closer and closer to human, your affinity for that, for that thing goes up and up and up until it becomes too human and then it drops off. And, and looking at um, Peter Joel Whitkin's um, Venus, I, I, I imagine a lot of people who find that ugly are experiencing an uncanny valley effect. Okay, so the origins of the term uncanny are obviously within the Surrealist movement in André Breton, who, who obviously founded the Surrealist movement in art in the 1920s. Um, obviously, it, it um, occurred obviously parallel to Freud's work or was informed by his work of the unconscious. Um, and uncanny, obviously, this is a new term, uncanny value, but the uncanny is the experience of deja vu, and it's also the experience of something both being eerily familiar and at the same time eerily alienating. Um, and so I think that, that obviously that chasm or that paradoxical sensation is sort of aggrandized or accentuated the more similar something feels um, when one sort of knows also simultaneously that it's not at all, when one has the knowledge and is equipped with the knowledge that it's not at all human. Um, and the uncanny, importantly, is a, we do in, intuitively categorize it as a form of ugliness. And one of the sort of reasons that I feel that, you know, if I look at, I've, I've actually got a list of all the substantive ugly terms. I mean, I can list them for you. There's the macabre, there's the kitsch, there's the sublime, there's the gothic, there's a whole host of them. Um, and the uncanny forms part of that along with the surreal. Um, and I think that if I had to define any of, of you know, say what's similar amongst them qualitatively as opposed to just saying that they cause pain, I would say that what occurs there is a sort of subversion of boundary. 
So for example, often in the uncanny, we have what's called the doppelganger effect. We often, there's also often twin shifts that goes on. We have phantom twins or conjoined twins, or we have the notion of the spectral, we have ghosts. That often occurs in the uncanny. So once again, it's this idea of something being sort of ontologically mirrored and that's not ontologically distinct. And that's why we could coin it or it's sort of designate it as a form of ugliness. So the, the second thought I had is very much related to this, and, and that is that I've had two types of experiences in my life, other than looking at art, where I've experienced this, this feeling, this uncanny feeling uh, repeatedly. So the first was when I came out as a gay man. Well, I was still a boy. I, was, I went to my first gay club when I was 17. And seeing two men kiss gave me this experience of, of oh my God, that's gross. Um, because it was an act that I'd seen done many, many times in a different context between heterosexuals, suddenly transposed or transported into this new environment. It was the same thing, but not quite the same thing. And I wonder, and, and that works so well with your definition of it's not quite enough to be itself, right? I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing you very badly. Um, <laughs> um, and then the second, the second type of experience, which I have very regularly, I no longer have that experience when I see two men kissing. Um, it became normal for me. But the, the second time I have that experience is I'm prosopagnosic. So I'm unable to recognize faces. I'm face blind. So um, if, I, if I were to bump into you tomorrow, I wouldn't recognize your face, but I would recognize your voice and I'd recognize your hair, I'd recognize your lipstick. I might recognize what you're wearing if you're still wearing the same clothes, but I won't recognize your face. And it happens even minute to minute with me. So if, if you were to turn your head, I would no longer recognize you. Or if, you, if the light were to change, I would no longer recognize you. And, but there's something still vaguely familiar about the face and at the same time, not at all. And it creates that incredible tension, this feeling of uncanniness um, when I look at a face, especially if I look at it for a while. If I'm watching someone talk for a while, they turn their head, they turn their head back. It's like, it's like, whoa, new face, new face, but not. It must be the same person, but it's not. And I think it's very much that experience of uncanniness that I, that I have. So it's also psychoanalysts explain that as a process of, or experience of dissociation that one almost feels detached from reality and one feels almost like an out-of-body experience. Almost like sometimes one is watching oneself watching. And I often had that same experience, although we're veering off from sort of ugliness, but that experience when you know someone really well and then you stand back and look at them as if you've never known them. Yeah, I've looked at my lover and I thought, you know, they're so seamlessly part of my experience and so deeply known. And yet I think partly what causes attraction is the capacity to step back and say, but yet you're not known at all to look at the person with fresh eyes and to think, hold on a second, this, this is you, this is you separate from me. It is what, it, and then what we do there is take what, what's called an aesthetic distance. Yes, and I, I think the experience is that they look in that moment deeply ugly um, because, because they are themselves but not quite themselves to be themselves. Um, and it's, it's in that feeling of like that disconnect that makes it a pro makes their face suddenly profoundly ugly. Um, and, and I, I often identify someone who I can recognize because there are instances when I can recognize someone's face and I think, gosh, they're beautiful just because I can recognize them, not because they have any aesthetic qualities other than that. So this experience of defam defamiliarization, which is obviously part of your ordinary stream of experience on a daily basis, as an extremely, I mean, Dickey and Bullo, who are aesthetic theorists, think about the sort of aesthetic position. And one does need that. One needs a sort of capacity to step into the, the position of that, who, that, that person who is in, in mystery. One needs to look at something as if one's never looked at it before. One needs to peel one's eyes in order to be a great spectator. One needs to stand back in a, a sort of unfamiliar, in a sort of a position of, of lack of expectation in order for possibilities to burgeon, to mushroom, to emerge. It's like any good theorist or any good sort of theoretician or any good sort of researcher, you need to be able to be okay with what emerges and not just superimpose some sort of expectation. It's a very important part of being sort of an aesthetic person that, that one stands and looks and waits, waits for the painting to speak to one, I'm using a painting as an example, and um, not only paintings work in this way, I mean, paintings do work in that way, because I always say, even as a creative person or a poet, 
one needs, even in the process of, make, of, of making, to let the work marinate overnight. There's something important that happens neurologically and I guess within the unconscious mind, some kind of haptic or sort of conceptual connections that are made that when one, or and perceptual connections that, 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 that sort of create the sense that when one stands before painting the next day, one sees something entirely different. No, it has to be okay also as a sort of aesthetic, as a person of sort of aesthetic caliber to be okay with not understanding, working, of not knowing, and of also kind of unfamiliar experiences, haptic and visceral sensation that cannot be named. And I think that many people are sort of um, what I call um, deprived aesthetically. They almost hook onto ugliness and beauty as their only two terms. Um, they don't have at their disposal or they don't have a treasure te chest of aesthetic terms to use. And an important, this is, I guess, where I can bring in the role of criticism. So the role of criticism for me is what I call the this, this task of extension. Extension is that this idea that we only learn about, we only learn how to identify aesthetic properties when we see many instances of that. So for example, we can only learn about the quality of delicateness in painting when we see many instances over history, for example, of Flemish painting, maybe of Japanese painting, and someone identifies delicateness within them, and then somehow we think that that critic can bequeath that, that knowledge to us through that explanation. So it's almost an explanation of how to look at a painting or how to look at an artwork. That's what crit real good criticism is. It's not just a snooty issuing out of evaluation. It's not just a ripping apart. It shouldn't, for me, great criticism is not about saying something is good or bad. It's about explaining what kind of experience it is about, what kind of experience it portrays or cultivates or, or embodies. And then helping other people around you as sort of, I guess you are the expert witness and expert writer to grasp onto those kinds of qualities. So I think that art is, there's this kind of idea that art is a kind of, psycho one can, can through criticism it's kind of a psycho aesthetic education kind of a microcosm for aesthetic training so that when one looks at artwork one can, and, and you know engages in criticism one can sort of learn to have a nuanced view of aesthetic properties and then when one looks out onto the world onto the vista of the world and the micro macrocosm of the world one is better at doing so so you raise a couple of things that i'd like to explore in more detail the one is this interesting line between a uh, revulsion and attraction and how you could feel that kind of in, in the romantic setting, let's say where you know, Jason gives the example of there's something visceral in a certain sexual act or a, you know, the way you feel about someone and it crosses this line between repulsion and attraction. And the other one is this, this line about familiarity. So, you know, we can become familiar with the work and appreciate it. As you say, you know, if we can, if you've immersed yourself in Renaissance work and you look at a new work, you can then say, I know why this is good because I've spent so much time immersed in this world. But the other bit is to sort of be able to have that experience of looking at a work afresh with new eyes, with distance, without the familiarity and the contempt that could come with familiarity. So I'd imagine for you, if I think about your, your father's work, which I you know, absolutely adore, um, for him, I imagine the way that he views his own work is very different from the way that you view his work or from the way a complete outsider would view his work. That if you've been immersed in it, um, the way that you relate to it is different. You might appreciate works that others don't appreciate because you know how hard it was to make or why it's exceptional based on the au revoir. But for someone else, they might um, look at it afresh and say, wow, there's something about this that really speaks to me. But maybe for you, if it was in your living room and it spoke to you over and over and over again, you can no longer see it in, the, in that way. I, I do have a certain aversion towards, or skepticism, I should say, around people who talk about art and have never made it. Um, and there is this sort of idea of criticism of the realm of the aesthetic for being what we call dreary. Um, and so I think actually Joseph Margolis writes a, a paper called Exercising the Dreariness of Aesthetics. And in that sense, he's kind of... Um, he is driving at aestheticians, sort of like Kant or, 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 or Hume, um, for talking about art in a kind of a priori armchair way when they have not their very little understanding of the process of making of what's, what we call sort of the, the real sort of materiality of the work. Um, and even, I think, an interesting quote was, I think we also spoke about um, Picasso and how Picasso you know, once said that artists, um, and sort of critics are 
totally sort of involved and enveloped by terms such as form and structure and tonality. And, and that's what they talk about when they get together. But when artists talk about get together, all they talk about is where we can where, the, where they can get cheap turpentine. So there's in, in Alkin's work, who's a great writer, there's this idea that the aesthetic is the realm of the aesthetic and aesthetic engagement is incredibly alienated from what we call studio talk. Um, and so what I believe is I think very few people who I think that the spectator who's never made themselves, who's never entered a ballet studio in sort of bar, cannot possibly have the kind of appreciation that someone who's been immersed in the difficulty of it has. I'm not saying that it's necessarily a better form of appreciation, but it's certainly a different one. I, I've had this experience many times as a writer. Um, I studied English literature and in English literature, what they do is they talk about all the things that writers do not care about at all. Um, so they talk about how to interpret a piece of writing through its socio-historical lens. They talk about applying all of these theoretical frameworks to, to the writing, like a Freudian framework or a Marxist framework or a, a feminist framework. Um, and, and, and nothing could be further from the reality of, of a writer who sits down and writes. Now, there might be a few writers who do this, who sit down and try to construct a piece of writing from a theoretical framework. Um, I'm going to sound like a total snob now, but I think very little of those writers. Um, you know, the act of writing really is about just trying to get the technical stuff right. You know, like you said, if you ask artists what they talk about, it's where do you get cheap turpentine? If you ask, um, if you, that's if you ask right, uh, artists, if you ask writers what they talk about, it's things like, um, how many adverbs should I use per hundred words? Um, or uh, 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 how, do you, how do you write a good character? Or um, how long should your chapters be? Or uh, how, how many beats should you have per scene? Or, you know, very technical, how, how do you write stuff that, that is going to be entertaining? Just the technical stuff. And how do you sell your, your writing? Um, you know, these are very like technical, very, just, just, just very down to earth concerns. Um, and when you look at the criticism of, of literature, it's not that at all. They don't say, oh, he uses so few adverbs. Um, you know, <laughs> they don't talk about that. But but when I, when I listen to audiobooks or read books, I'm listening to the beauty of the writing in that sense. I'm looking to see, is it technically brilliant? And, and the most technically brilliant writer I've ever read is Stephen King, because he writes just so crisply. His characters are so well formed. His stories have exactly the right ups and downs and beats, and they follow the right kind of heroic path for the narrator. It's, like, it's exactly right, or for the protagonist. It's exact, it gets all of it right. But if you speak to a literary critic, he'll scoff at Stephen King and say, no, you should read um, Chaucer. We should read Oscar Wilde. Um, but they're not as technically good as Stephen King. So, you know, I, I think what the artist cares about and what the art critic cares about, I think you're absolutely right, are completely different. So there are some great art critics. And I think that there's also a question of what a good piece of criticism does. Um, that it's really interesting. It's quite similar to this notion of the experience, experience near interpretation and psychoanalysis, that somehow a good piece of criticism captures the experience instead of reducing it or what I call torturing it. Um, in fact, we have this issue in poetry in schools in which um, poetry is what I sort of, um, it is bound like Chinese feet. It is sort of subjected to what I call paralysis by analysis. But whereas, in fact, poetry is highly synesthetic and poetry is meant to be experienced and not analysed. And I think that people sort of hold on as a defence to theoretical structures as a kind of not only flash night, but flashlight, but a safety kit when they're faced with what I said before, the ineffable, and the experience themselves, which often they can't verbalise and they're afraid of. It's something people are also afraid of not knowing what to say or not really knowing how they feel in response to an So I'd like you to talk about one of my favorite Joel Peter Witkin works. It's called The Kiss. I think it's one of the, the first pieces of his that I'd encountered. And I think when I encountered it, I felt a few things. The, the first was a sense of, of despair and anger. Um, it is a, you know, a picture of, of uh, 
of a of a of a severed head. Um, but there's something so intriguing about the work, something that necessarily pulls you in. Uh, it, it seems like kind of the epitome of of the grotesque. Um, and I gather there's a fascinating story behind it as well. But yes, the fascinating story. Well, Joel Peter Wickin had a fascinating life because he started taking photographs at the age of 13. And his first sort of photographic body of or corpus was on um, sort of circus freaks at Coney Island. Um, and as I think he does sort of note that his first sexual experience was with one of those freaks, I think a transgendered person. Um, who was called Three-Legged Chicken. <laughs> um, and um, so that's really, really important. And so then he was interested in sort of the macabre from very, very young because he, he notes two important experiences. One was that he lived with his grandmother who actually had an amputated leg. And the leg was widely exposed and had quite a um, putrid smell. And so he gained an interest then. And then he had this very pivotal experience um, when, or later in his life, where he witnessed a car crash, although we don't know if this is fictional, and um, the, in, in that car crash, a girl was decapitated and her head rolled down the street. So his somewhat, what we call, could perverse attraction to, to uh, instances of the macabre and formed very early on. And he also, in, in uterine loss, he was actually a triplet and he lost his, his, his sister, who was named Sarah. Um, so the this was actually one of his formative and first works that sort of were done in the studio because some of his earlier works were actually street photography. And um, he's obviously, he's had to, there's a lot of ethical issues around his work and he's had to get permission to get away to more trees and more orcs. And he did get permission with the kiss to, to use and to hold and to host and to store um, I think in some sort of formaldehyde, these heads this, of the well, it was it was one person um, to, to hold these at um, the University of New Mexico, and what he did was he I think the heads were already severed, and we'll show the image. He placed them together in a kind of resuscitative kiss. Um, but what's what's the interesting story about it is he was actually um, kicked out of the university forever for that, um, and so one does ask the question about why that was so unbelievably offensive. Um, I'm not sure if he did get permission, but I do remember that he did. Um, and it does, it does strike a chord with me as to um, why this kind of exploration of the dead and this kind of what I think is a kind of bestowal of sanctity on the dead through art um, is so off-putting and offensive. Yeah, I think if, if I reflect on my initial experience with I had this rage because I felt like you're taking someone's body and you're desecrating it. You know, you're putting this corpse on display. And then I sort of, I read his account of it, which is, he says, well, you take something which is the perfect representation of decay and death, the severed head an elderly severed head as well. And then you grant it new life in this romantic moment of a kiss of the way of giving life. Um, and then you immortalize that by photographing it. And suddenly all the anger and disgust and offense that I had just completely melted away. And I thought, that is an amazing thing that you've done, how you can transform, you know, something decayed into something alive, into something um, serene. Um, and that's sort of an interesting thing about art generally, that we can, you can create this experience that is transportive, um, that plays around with our ordinary intuitions about something and then metamorphosizes them to something else. Okay, so one of the really interesting dilemmas and paradoxes that Kant faces, and then later on many other theorists, is what's called the artistic problem of sublimation in art. Um, and I think that's possibly why Jason said to us that he didn't find any of these great artworks ugly. Um, what's always interesting is that content is dependent on form in a way that form isn't dependent on content. Um, so, in fact, what we are, when we look at a representation of an ugly thing, we can note that that thing, that representation, or that we can identify that the, the identity of that thing is ugly. Um, in that case, it's a severed head, it's been touched by death, all of those kinds of things. Um, we, the act of cannibalism that we mentioned in Goya's um, example is, is also a, a, an embodiment of this. Um, but the way in which it has been painted with its technical expertise, with its with potentially added elements like lighting and use of space or movement, 
um, superimpose a kind of quality on it. And then there's also the quality of the inherent, the inherent qualities inherent in the material itself. So there's a kind of coagulative, icing-like, cakey quality of paint that we find beautiful. In fact, even if we, you know, we, Jeff Koons is a great example. If we made the, sort of a, a you know, a seeping wound from gold. We, there's no way in which we could find the gold, the, the seeping wound. We don't see the seeping wound there. The goldness overtakes and almost overshadows that beauty of the gold, whatever aesthetic quality that it, that it represents or exudes, overtakes or overrides the identity of the original or the ugliness of the original thing that it represents. Whitkin does that too. He hallows and honors through this, the, his incredible technical expertise, through his printing, he has an exquisite sense of light and form. And, um, and also then he does mark the surface on top through, you know, gold splinterings and through etching and photographics. And he unleashes forms over it and his sense of placement and composition are absolutely genius. And one could marvel at that kind of expertise. And in some way through that, he sanctifies what would other, otherwise be a kind of blasphemous object. So we, we started this discussion um, talking about a paradox, right? So the paradox is um, there are ugly things, um, ugly pieces of art, or pieces of art that depict ugliness, and, and that distinction, I'm guessing, is very, is very important. Um, but there are these pieces of art that depict ugly um, uh, topics or ugly, ug ugly um, subjects or objects, um, and yet we are drawn to them. And, and I wonder whether part of the reason why, part of the reason that explains that paradox is because they're done with such a high technical skill. Um, yes. That is one explanation. So, um, but that, unfortunately, that's one explanation. And as I've alluded to, it's called the problem of sublimation. Um, and when I think, I think when you looked at Dali's work, the reason you didn't find it inherently ugly was that it is what we call a form of veristic surrealism. And surrealism, that's a form of surrealism that's incredibly realistic and illusionistic. And people find that absolutely almost like a magic trick when an artist can mimic the experience of looking at something in ordinary reality. And then there's it's a juxtaposition of, of those realistic things to make it surreal or uncanny. Um, and so that's one of the reasons, but that doesn't go on to explain why we find things that aren't represented are inherently comforting or, or fascinating and intriguing. And there's a whole other explanation for that. Um, one explanation, and I, you know, a lot of my work wasn't purely philosophical. I think that's important to say. I did have to venture into an empirical project of, of scavenging texts that did describe this phenomenological encounter. And um, so I think that one of the, and, and I then obviously went deeply into psychoanalytic literature. Um, and through several theorists, um, Lacan, Kristeva, Melanie Klein, um, I came to understand it does, the ugly object is obviously it gives us a sense of this monistic reality of, of a reality that existed before our, in our, early in our developmental years, but also early on in you know, prehistoric times, before the, the world itself existed. Um, we, we see that in lots of mystical accounts um, or religious accounts of the beginnings of the world that are incredibly primordial. Um, and so part of, if we look at these texts, what they describe is that when we, before we have a sense of object and of language and a concept, you know, when we're in an infantile reality and all that exists for us is our mother and a kind of believing seamless um, experience of things um, and an and, and undifferentiation between self and somatis, the somatosensory and the perceptual, um, that we, we have, uh, that, that there's something very pleasurable about this lack of separation of, of us and the rest of the world. Because then if we, in the uterine, in this kind of in uterine bliss, we, we never have a need because nothing is separate from us. We just get fed. It's if there's no separation from us and the object with, to, uh, that we yearn for. And so there's a kind of, it, it does represent this endless, this past sort of ethereal memory of endless life supply. And that's one reason this monistic reality is very comforting. It's the sense of, of unification we may have experienced, this, this deep unification with other things that, that we may have experienced in this virus. <laughs> um, that's one reason, and one has to go deep into psychoanalytic texts to understand that. And the other reason is that it's incredibly stimulating, I think, because it's unlocatable within our schemas, and it is un, 
um, representable through language, and thus, and this, you know, Gunbridge describes ugliness as it sort of triggers a squirrel in a cage. There's this experience of not being able to figure it out, and therefore there's a kind of cognitive pleasure that arises from looking at it and um, having a kind of kaleidoscope of ideas or of interpretations and also of, of trying to find a word to figure it out and to pin it down. And there's excitement in that, so that's one kind of explanation. Mandy, just before you go, I have one last question. Um, and I'm asking it not on behalf of myself. Um, I'm asking it because I'm sure that it's going to come up amongst our listeners. Do you think that Peter Joel Whitkin's work is transphobic? So do you think that in displaying um, these transgendered people in a way that is supposed to make us feel that it is ugly, do you think that's transphobic? Um, I don't think that he's trying to present them as if they're ugly. I think he's trying to present them with a deep reverence. And um, one can only understand that by through a comparison of his work through the ones to, to the ones that he references. In fact, Whitkin's work has been called a Chinese allegory, box of allegories within allegories. Um, and so one, what I have done in my own analysis is identified what I call mystical styles. And I've clearly identified the way in which Whitkin's style in his form um, and his construction of place have actually created a kind of what I call geomorphological mysticism that is a mysticism of the ugly that's a response to other forms of mysticism in other periods of art, his times in art history. So in doing so, I think that he has not desecrated but consecrated um, any form of ugliness that he presents. I think it's a good answer. Um, Mandy, it was a pleasure chatting to you and especially about something I know so little about. Um, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, you know, on this on on this channel, I feel like I learn a lot because we talk to we talk to incredible guests like yourself, um, who are so specialized and have done so much work, years and years and years and years of study on something that you know I've learned about briefly or spent a few minutes thinking about or talked about with friends, but have never gone to these depths. And one of the wonderful things about having this channel is that we get to talk to brilliant, brilliant minds about things that they know so much about. Um, so it's incredibly enriching. And thank you very much for today. Well, man, I have to say this has been an absolutely electric conversation. Um, I think this has been so much fun to talk to someone who theorizes about art, who makes art, who can speak about it in such a passionate, uh, visceral way, can, as you say, open up the treasure chest of ways of engaging with art, that it's not simply beautiful and ugly, that there are so many textures inside of it all. Um, and we'd love to have you back. I'm sure there are many, many things we could talk about uh, for many, many hours.